On This Week in Enterprise Tech, the final word on net neutrality. Not really. Google becomes a cell phone service. HP buys Aruba. And Apple Pay fraud? Twilight on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 130, recorded March 6, 2015. Net neutral, Google positive. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Nitro. Nitro accelerates the way businesses create, prepare, and sign PDF files. Anytime, anywhere, saving you and your business time. To learn more and try it free for 14 days, visit gonitro.com slash twit. That's gonitro.com slash twit. And by HipChat. Collaborate, save time, and be more productive with your teams. HipChat is IM video chat plus file, code, and screen sharing all in one place. Invite your team members and get a free 30-day trial of the full version of HipChat at hipchat.com slash twiet. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Ballas here, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. And I'm joined by my co-hosts, co -ho yeah, my co-hosts, starting with Mr. Brian Chi, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. Brian, it's bright over there. Yeah, well, we actually got some good sun today. I'm actually doing a shout out. I'm playing with a, um, it's basically a new um, display system. Think of it as a Roku on steroids. It's Ooh. the commercial version of a Roku. So it's angry and has security issues. All right, fantastic. But well, let's also go to my other co-host, Mr. Curtis Franklin from Information Week Radio. Curtis, how are things over on the right coast? Well, Padre, not sunny today. It's a uh, cloudy and, for us, pretty cool day, which makes it absolutely perfect to be in here doing the twiet thing. Indeed, and let's get straight to doing the twiet because we know that we've been kind of gone the last couple of weeks. Uh, we had a pre-record, we had some vacation time, and we may have missed out on some big news. So let's go ahead and jump straight in to the blips. This first one is about Google going wireless. No, for realsies. Straight out of Mobile World Congress, Sundar Pichai confirmed that IT wonks uh, had been smelling and seeing for a while that cell phone users will be getting Google as an option. Google's getting to the mobile service provision business. Pichai explained to the crowd in Barcelona that Google will become an NVNO. That's a mobile virtual network operator. This comes a month after Google Inc. to deal with T-Mobile and Sprint to use their cellular and Google's wireless to provide wireless service to phones. Though Sundar took pains to explain that Google doesn't intend to be a carrier at scale and that they will work with existing partners, look for Google Wireless to be as disruptive to mobile carriers as Google Fiber has been to telco incumbents. In other words, yay Google. Uh, two new Azure services go GA. Azure Search and Azure Document DB database services were announced by Microsoft on Thursday. These two services are going to add some serious oomph to Azure's out-of-the-box capabilities. Azure Search, the full-text search engine service, is general av generally available right now, while Azure Document DB will, will be released on April 8th. Azure Document DB is a managed, highly scalable, NoSQL document database service that designed basically to compete with MongoDB. Azure Search will enable developers to embed full-text search functionality into web and mobile apps. It supports 50 languages, tapping the natural language processing technology that's used by Microsoft Office and Bing. More cloud, more Azure, more capabilities. The battle for cloud app integration just keeps on rolling. Sorry. But the market is allergic to Superfish adware, and Lenovo is finally catching on. In a move to fix the massive fallout from the disclosure that adware pre-installed by Lenovo could potentially be used to compromise a wide range of services on your Lenovo laptop, 
Lenovo has just vowed to remove all adware from the machines with an aim to become a leader in providing cleaner, safer PCs. My opinion is that I told you so to Lenovo. Oh, sure. I have a bridge that I can sell you really cheap. Are you paranoid about security? Are you worried that the NSA is recording your conversations? Well, if you hate the idea that some script kitty may own your device, never fear. Black phone, Black phone 2 is here. Silent Circle, the company behind the original security-hardened Black Phone, announced at MWC that the Black Phone 2 will be available in July. Sporting an 8-core processor, 3 gigabytes of memory, a 5.5-inch screen, and a larger removable battery, the Black Phone 2 will set you back $629 and offer all the same end-to-end -end encryption and device security as the original, but with enough of a spec boost to keep up with the Joneses. Watch your language. There's a new model out that looks for internet security threats. OpenDNS has introduced a new tool for security. NLP Rank is an advanced threat detection model that uses the malicious language of the internet to identify suspicious domains almost as soon as they're registered. OpenDNS security researcher Jeremiah O'Connor first got the idea for NLP Rank in November after Kaspersky Labs revealed details about the Dark Hotel campaign. O'Connor realized that the Dark Hotel attackers and the APT1 hacking group followed the same basic patterns when they were choosing the domain names they used in phishing campaigns. Hey says they're not quite ready to put NLP Rank into production. They want to wait until further testing proves the tool doesn't produce too many false positives. There's no question that the bad guys keep improving the attacks. It's really good to see something innovative from the good guys in response. In a move sure to have startups cheering, the Department of Homeland Security is relaxing its policy on work visas for spouses coming into the United States. Starting May 26, spouses will be able to apply for their own H-4 work visa while their spouse's efforts for an H-1B green card go unabated. Previously, if one spouse worked, the other had, to, had the option of being a housewife or house husband. Since an H-4 is quite a bit less expensive to set up, startups can take advantage of the spousal skilled labor pool previously going untapped. Take this one from the Captain Obvious file. Stingrays can disrupt cell service. Go figure. In a newly uncovered document detailing the use of cell phone interceptors, an FBI agent described how the devices had the potential to intermittently disrupt cellular service of wireless customers in the vicinity of the device. While this is a no-duh for those who understand wireless tech, the document included several other interesting tidbits. Among them, the Stingers, which passed judicial review only because law, because law enforcement agencies agreed to use them only in the case of emergencies, were in fact used far more often. In fact, in almost 200 cases in which Stingrays were used in a jurisdiction in Tallahassee, Florida, only 29% of the use was determined to be an emergency. Now, when we come back... I know you're tired of hearing about it, but we got to talk about it because it's big. We're going to be diving back into net neutrality. But first, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the first sponsor of the Twiat Riot. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you use PDFs? Well, of course you do. Of course I do. Of course we all do. PDFs have become the de facto standard for pushing important documents across your network, your company, and in fact, the world. Now, PDF documents are useful, but sometimes... I wish, and I'm sure that you wish, they could be just a bit more usable, a bit more flexible, a bit more feature-packed. Well, now they can be, thanks to the newest sponsor of the Twiat Riot, Nitro. Now, Nitro is the leading alternative to Adobe Acrobat. From individual users to large enterprises, Nitro gives you everything you need to easily view, create, prepare, and sign PDF files, delivering more value through a clean UI, simple deployment, and the best customer service in the business. Nitro lets you easily connect and host documents in the Nitro cloud, enabling you to securely complete transactions with legally binding, let me repeat that, legally binding e-signatures. It allows you to print to PDF from any application using the Nitro Pro virtual printer, and it features simple one-click PDF conversion to any Microsoft Office format and back again. Now, with Nitro, you can add text anywhere on a PDF document, even if it doesn't have interactive fields. And it includes an intuitive set of tools that let you manipulate text, change fonts, customize layouts, and so much more. The engineers at Nitro base their tools on the Microsoft Office ribbon. So if you can use Word, you can use Nitro. 
No matter if you're transforming scanned documents or images into PDFs with OCR, searching through PDFs for specific pieces of information, or collaborating with colleagues and offering feedback. Nitro is the way PDFs work for you. Nitro Pro is used by over half a million businesses, including 50% of the Fortune 500. Don't you think it's time for you to try them as well? Now, here's what we want you to do. We want you to visit GoNitro.com slash twit to learn more about Nitro and their document solutions. And as a special offer for fans of twit, you can try it free for 14 days. No credit card required. That's GoNitro.com slash twit. GoNitro.com slash twit. And we thank Nitro for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. We welcome back to the show your friend and mine, the... The Jiminy Cricket of this week in Enterprise Tech, Mr. Oliver Rist. Oliver, thank you very much for coming back on to Twyatt. Thank you for having me. Nice to be here. Now, uh, since the last time you were on, the talk was all about net neutrality. And again, the talk is all about net neutrality. So let's dive straight back into net neutrality. Now, last week, late last week, last Thursday, in a 3-2 to two decision, the FCC voted to reclassify Internet service providers under Title II of the Federal Communications Act. Now, this puts ISPs directly under the regulatory authority of the FCC. It makes it legal for the FCC to demand transparency in peering arrangements, something that they had previously not been able to do. And it also seems to make a very vocal part of the country believe that the Internet just imploded. But, but here's, let's, let's put all the rumor and the hearsay apart. Here are a few of the things that we know. We know that FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler, Commissioner Mignon Clyburn, and Commissioner Jessica Rosenswell, the three Democrats on the commissions, voted for the reclassification. We know that the two Republicans, Commissioner Ajit Pai and Commissioner Michael O'Reilly, voted against. We also have not yet seen exactly what they intend to do with the Title II reclassification. We should see that in the next couple of weeks. And 30 days after they release the details, it becomes law. Major ISPs like Comcast and Verizon have already promised to sue. They've already put their legal departments into motion. And we also know that the FCC has a huge war chest of about $20 billion unallocated from the last sale of wireless spectrum. So this legal battle could go on and on and on. Uh, these are the things that we know. But, uh, Chibert, let me throw this over to you first. What are some of the things that we don't really know but are kind of now starting to pick up about what's going on in the net neutrality battle? Well, what we really don't know is how the FCC is going to handle um, special circuits. We don't know how they're going to be handling um, the transitions, you know, how, how you pay transit fees in between them. We still don't quite know what's, what's going to happen with that. Uh, we do have a little bit of a clue because of you know, historically, they did similar actions when you started breaking up of the um, bell system. So look at them possibly using some of those tactics. Um, the big bell, com bell um, corporations actually did a lot of lawsuits, but I don't see too much difference. It's going to be a lot of wait and see on uh, how they handle interconnects. That's going to be a big one in private lines. Right, right. Oliver, let me let me throw over to you. Uh, what what are you looking for specifically? I mean, yes, we need to know what the FCC is actually going to do. We want to see their regulations, their proposals in words. But what are the things that you think they need to tackle first? What do they need to tackle first? Uh, half of me doesn't care. But um, um, honestly, I mean, they're going to wind up... They're going to wind up in court is where they're going to wind up. Uh, I would have to list all the different ways that Verizon is going to object to this. So list that. Okay. So, they're, yeah, they're definitely going to have to defend against Verizon because, remember, Verizon was the company that made this necessary in the first place because they got the original net neutrality regulations thrown out. Uh, Curtis, let me go over to you. Uh, there, there's an interesting angle here in that – You've got the large ISPs. You've got Comcast. You've got AT&T. You've got uh, Verizon, who are crying foul, who are saying the same things that they've said this entire campaign, which is this is going to destroy investment. This is going to destroy infrastructure. This is going to raise taxes. It's going to raise prices. It's going to make everything not work anymore. But you've had a couple of notable smaller voices, people like uh, Dane Jasper, the CEO of Sonic, uh, a regional ISP, 
who has said that smaller ISPs should actually embrace this because this finally puts the smaller ISPs on the same playing field as the large ISPs. Rather than being able to count on sweetheart deals that they cut with one another, they're now going to be forced to actually include all those smaller carriers when they do discussions of how the internet works. Is, is that a valid point? I mean, does is this small ISP friendly? Well, I think it's probably friendlier to the small ISPs than it is to the large ISPs, although there's a great deal of, of what the large ISPs are saying right now that frankly um, strike me as the, the opening salvos in what will surely be the, the longer legal and um, lobbying battles. Uh, th this isn't over at all. Uh, it's not even close to over because Congress can still weigh in and, and wreak havoc on this. But I do think that the smaller ISPs uh, stand under the current readings to benefit more than the, the larger ISPs do. The, the fact is that the larger ISPs, uh, many of the, uh, especially wireless carriers, have been just basically getting unlimited funds out of this. And and frankly, if you've ever done business as any kind of supplier to any ISP or telco, uh, the amounts of cash that they are able to throw around on a moment's notice will just, you know, make your eyes bleed. Uh, but the thing that worries me in all of this is, is the law of unintended consequences. Uh, there's no question that this needed to be done in some ways. I'm just fearful that what the FCC has done will lead to us having ISPs that are regulated with the same tender solicitation to consumers that govern most state electrical board rulings. Um, this is not necessarily... Uh, bringing us to the land of electronic milk and honey just yet. Right. Actually, it was an interesting point you brought out about how much cash is being thrown out. We've got Rob H. in the chat room who uh, wrote, well, why can't Congress just write a new law to handle it instead of trying to do the square peg thing? Uh, well, we're not going to cry corruption, but we will point out the fact that Comcast, just Comcast last year, donated more to political campaigns than the oil and the electrical uh, industry combined. So when you start going to Congress, you're really going to a bunch of people who have a vested interest in supporting their constituency, their constituency being the people who really don't want net neutrality because they're making a lot of money because we don't have it. Uh, Chibert, I, I do want to bring something back, and let's, let's talk about Jane again. One of the things that, uh, Dane, sorry, one of the things that Mr. Jasper pointed out was the fact that the 2002 reclassification, or I should say classification, of ISPs as information services really gutted the 1996 Telecommunications Act. And the reason why the FCC did that then was because they didn't think there was going to be a problem with intermodal competition. In other words, they didn't want multiple cable providers and multiple DSL providers and multiple wireless or electrical uh, uh, internet providers. They thought that those those services would, would compete with, enough, with each other and that would be enough competition. Obviously, that didn't turn out. There's really one technology that could provide the bandwidth that we need, and that's cable. For, uh, cable versus DSL, is, it's horrible. You could possibly get uh, Fios in there, but the deployment rate is so little that it's really cable, cable, cable. So what Jasper has brought up is the fact that what they want now with these new net neutrality regulations is to encourage intramodal competition. In, in other words, they want companies that are on the same footing that can provide similar service to spur competition within that industry. D do you see that happening? I mean, if, if the FCC can actually see the peering arrangements and if they can say, no, you can't treat that ISP differently than you treat that ISP, does that encourage new players to enter the market? Oh, yes. I, th I really and truly think it will. Actually, one of the dark horses that have been very, very quiet is the um, power production people. Um, they've been wanting to sell uh, or rent long-haul dark fiber. And that's been one of the places where the special deals and so forth have been um, anti-competition. 
you know, when you start talking about wireless, you start talking about the small ISPs, how do they get from one place to another? How do they get from their pond to another pond? And uh, I think Title II and this uh, net neutrality is going to probably squeeze open the door enough so that our friends at the power companies might actually be able to start playing in this game. And that, shall we say, is going to be a disruptive factor. Indeed. Uh, there was another important decision that was made last week. Uh, and actually, I think this one may actually be more important as far as the consumer is concerned than even the net neutrality regulations. And that was the FCC voting to remove the, the restrictions to municipal broadband networks. Now, I, I want to throw this over to you first, uh, uh, Oliver. It was the same 3-2 vote along party lines. This vote came about because local officials, so in other words, mayors and governors and, and the local folk who run their municipalities, came to the FCC and said, we would really like to run out a gigabit or better network for, for our citizens, but we can't do it because there's a state law against doing it, because it would, it would compete with the incumbents. Mm -hmm. Now, this seems to be more clear and dry, but I think it's getting lumped in with net neutrality. I mean, municipal broadband is a good thing, right? I mean... What, what are the negatives to allowing municipalities to build out their own networks? None I can think of. I mean, anything that, that encourages uh, competition is a, is a bonus, right? Right. Uh, for, for a second there, you did the well, Power, you Power Rangers morphing into Curtis, but that's okay. Yeah. Because we, we I know was wondering which one of us was supposed to be talking. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Uh, Oliver, uh, let, me, let me ask you this. So we encourage competition, and we, we encourage competition in the same vein, I think, that Google did with Google Fiber by, by making the, the incumbents afraid that someone else is going to come into their territory and deploy a better solution for less money, they are now forced to actually spend money on rolling out better infrastructure. I mean, that's the theory, right? That's the theory, and I expect it'll be the practice. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, in communication with some guys out in Tennessee who live up in the hills, and they're constantly complaining that they have only one cable provider that they can use if they don't want to default to like 4G cell service or 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 something. So uh, they actually brought this story to to my attention. They're all they're all waiting for their local municipalities who have been clamoring for this to do exactly that. Whether or not they can afford it, uh, I don't know. We'll we'll see. But uh, for for people who have difficulty getting good access and who are usually relegated to even less choices than the rest of us, it's only a positive. Actually, Oliver, great point there, if they can afford it. This is one of these things that's often uh, misunderstood or overlooked. In fact, one of the Google Fiber cities was actually a takeover of a failed municipal broadband rollout. They just did not expect to incur all the costs that they did. It was way more expensive, than they, so they halted the program until Google came in and finished it under the name of Google Fiber. Let me throw this over to you, Curtis. When we start to see the first and the second and the third municipal broadband rollout fail. Does this prove that the ISPs were right or is this just more obstructionist politics? I mean, for example, I will bring up an example we have here in San Francisco. Again, this comes from, from Dane Jasper. He told me about how Sonic could, theoretically, if all they had to do was pay for the permits and pay for the trenching, they could roll out fiber at the cost of about four to $600 per house. But because they have to go through all the obstacles that are put up by the incumbents who will challenge them along every step of the way, it costs $5,000 for every house that they pass, even if they don't run to that house. Does that remain or does this removal of state restrictions on municipal broadband just now mean that cities are going to meet that same sort of resistance? Well, I don't know that cities will meet the same resistance. It depends largely on the nature of the contract that exists between the incumbent and the city. Uh, the nice thing is what this does is that it allows that battle to take place on that level. In other words, if it's coming up, if a, if a city is coming up towards the renewal of the contract with an incumbent, then they can negotiate a city run system into the, the, the contract if the provision for one doesn't exist earlier. Um, and it means that they can go ahead and move forward with something like wireless if there's no mention of that at all in the contract. So it, it lets it happen on a, on a contractual basis between the city and the utility, the, the incumbent that they're dealing with. 
what had happened in a couple of states is that the state legislatures, um, under the guiding, heavily moneyed hands of the incumbents, uh, had shut down that discussion. They had said that regardless of whether the two parties were willing to enter the discussion, they were forbidden from doing so. Um, this doesn't mean that every municipality will be able to do it, uh, even if they want to, but it means that the discussions can start, and that's not a bad step in and of itself. Right. Chibert, I'm going to give you the last word here because of the of the four of us, you are the only one who actually had a hand in deploying something that could be considered a municipal broadband network. What are the what are the pitfalls that you see here? I mean, obviously, we, we like this move. We like the fact that you could have cities speak up for themselves and build out their own networks. But what what are the challenges they're going to run into that you see that they don't yet? Well, the number one problem with any government agency, especially state and local governments, is they're they're so worried about being fair and even and so forth that they can't negotiate the kind of aggressive deals that a lot of the carriers can do. Um, the kind of the halfway point that I actually saw worked relatively well with the um, in the state of Hawaii is. Oceanic Cablevision, as they were running fiber and so forth uh, all over the place, as part of their agreement for operating in the state of Hawaii, is they actually had to go and run fiber links to a lot of the government buildings. That is, stay, save the state of Hawaii megabucks. However, I, I still have problems with municipalities. You know, they, that's not their um, area of expertise. So I would, I'm predicting that we're probably going to see a lot of these fail because it's going to be, oh, my friend kind of knows how to do this. Let's let him run the division. And they're not going to be bringing in the people that really and truly understand this. Um, and I, we're probably going to see a whole bunch of these projects fail. Yeah, I think so too. Well, gentlemen, uh, I think we should probably move on to the next story. Uh, that will be the last time we ever talk about net neutrality. I'm sure that it will never come up ever again in any future episodes of This Week in Enterprise Tech. That's the last word. Thank you. No. No. Okay, no, but let's go ahead and move on to something else that actually is, is big news. And we have one of the people who uh, helped to break the story here on the show. That's HP buying Aruba. A computer networks and services giant HP is buying wireless solutions company Aruba Networks. Here's, again, what we know. We know that Aruba sold at $24.67 a share, which means it wasn't really a premium over the regular price. That puts the acquisition price in the ballpark of $3 billion, plus about $300 million in cash that HP will get in the purchase. Aruba is a wireless and mobility a solutions provider. HP already has their own wireless solution, and they've integrated Aruba's ClearPath technology into their IMA, which is their, their big selling intelligent management solution center. Now, this is part of Meg Whitman's strategy announced last year to split the company into two pieces. You're going to have the enterprise side and you're going to have the consumer side, the printers slash PCs. HP's networking sales fell in the first quarter of 2015, down 11%. However, Aruba sales increased, totaling $729 million in 2014 and on track for $1 billion by 2017. Aruba CEO Dominic, Dominica Orr and CTO Kiriti Melkote, oh, wow, will stay on to lead the new wholly owned division of HP. Curtis, I'm going to throw it to you because you actually wrote the story that we're quoting. What are the signs? Because you, you talked about these signs of getting it right or wrong. What are the signs we'll be looking for? What would be the right thing to happen in the next six months? What's the wrong thing? Well, I think what everyone is saying constitutes most of the right thing is if HP pretty much leaves Aruba alone. Uh, if you look at another acquisition uh, that might be the model for this, if you look at what Dell did with uh, SonicWall, uh, Dell bought the company but didn't go in and immediately disrupt the culture, didn't immediately go in and change out the management. Uh, they pretty much left the company alone. They started integrating it more heavily into their management systems, but, but generally left it alone. Most observers are hoping that's what happens with Aruba. Uh, HP had already begun OEMing Aruba uh, access points. And as you say, they had already started integrating Aruba into their management system. 
So the groundwork has been laid on the technical side to do the right thing. If we see a bunch of people leaving, if we see a sudden replacement of existing Aruba management with HP longtime managers, I think that will be a key sign that things are going very wrong. Um, if the biggest change that occurs is the label on the access points and, and wireless switches is changed to read something like Aruba by HP, then that will be a sign that uh, HP has learned some lessons and they're getting things right because there is almost universal recognition that wireless is one of those areas that HP has fumbled badly in the past half dozen years. So let Aruba be Aruba. That's the sign of the good. Exactly so. Okay. Oliver, I want to throw over to you because this, this is definitely in your beat. This is a blockbuster acquisition. There, there are some people who, who feel that maybe this is a panic buy. HP did take a big drop in the division that's supposed to be making the money. They know the consumer division's kind of flat. You're not going to make a whole lot because the margins are horrible. But the enterprise, the service side, the server side is supposed to be making them cash. 11% drop in the first quarter of 2015 is absolutely the wrong direction. In the meantime, you've got Aruba who seems to be going in the right direction. But people are going to ask, what's the value here? I mean, yeah, Aruba makes a good product, but HP makes its own wireless system. So they're just going to abandon that and brand Aruba? No, they're going to do exactly what uh, uh, Zuckerberg did when he when he bought the, the the chat app, right, for 19 billion bucks. He didn't buy it for for the tech. He bought it for the business. So they're looking for Aruba's customers. If HP wanted to build something that 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 was similar or even the same as what Aruba has, they could do it, right? They got the billions, but they don't. That's not what they're hunting. Mm, okay, interesting. Okay, so Chibert, let me throw that over to you because that's also a very interesting angle to take, which is HP's after the customers. They want the Rolodex. They want the people who have already bought into Aruba system that they can continue to service and upgrade over the years, hoping, of course, to grow that, that estimated $1 billion by 2017. But they didn't go after a company that has amazing tech and IP. Aruba's a good company. They make good gear. But I can think of at least three or four different companies that offer what could be considered the next generation of wireless, who could have sold for a lot less and given HP some very distinctive IP, distinctive technology. So again, I'd ask, what's the play here? Aruba instead of Xerus or Ruckus or, or one of the others that have tech that's not yet being implemented across the industry? Well, actually, I think it's, I agree with Oliver, they want the Rolodex. The other thing that people keep forgetting about Aruba is Aruba has licenses that have to be renewed annually, and it's by the number of users. So that's a continuing stream of revenue. Um, so that's another thing. However, my spin on this is keep in mind, HP is investing very, very heavily in software-defined networks. And the enterprise with BYOB wants wi wireless. It, it's a premise. you got to have it if you if you're going to be playing the BYOB game. Now, what Aruba does have is they've got an architecture that allows you to literally extend SDN into the wireless without a huge amount of redesign. So I do I disagree with Oliver in one thing in that I think they did kind of want some of the technology uh, in addition to that Rolodex. Right, and, and just to be clear, Oliver didn't say... That they didn't want the tech because Oliver will be mad at me. That's right. It is. <laughs> Damn. Damn straight. <laughs> okay. Gentlemen, when we come back, we're going to be talking about Google wanting to move into the cell phone service provision business and Apple Pay, now with fraud. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take another break to thank the second sponsor of the Twyet Riot. Now, if you work in a team, you know that team communications aren't the same as normal communications. You can't just send off an email or an IM or a text. You need some sort of institutional memory. You need a way to keep everyone in sync. You need a way for those bits and pieces of communication to make sense for the team. Now, you, you could cobble together a couple of different solutions. You could maybe go to this vendor and that vendor and try to get best of breed, or you could go to one place you could go to HipChat. Now, it's a communications tool that is specifically designed for businesses. HipChat is IM, video chat, document sharing, screen sharing, system updates, and code sharing integrated into one simple platform. 
Uh, email is too slow. Meetings get sidetracked. And regular IM just doesn't cut it for groups. Video chat can be frustrating, and sending documents doesn't really mean anything if it's just filed in a folder that gets forgotten. But HipChat combines all of those tools, makes them make sense, and keeps your team in sync. And it works from any device, no matter where you are or what you're using. Best part, HipChat integrates with the top developer tools like GitHub, Jira, Zendesk, and more. Go to the website today and check out the 57 services that HipChat plays nice with. HipChat brings your entire project and team communications together. And really, can you ask for more from your business communication suite? Now, here's what we'd like you to do. We would like you to get your team on the same page in seconds. There's a freemium version that you can use free forever. But for the next 30 days, you'll also get the full version of HipChat, which includes the bonus features of video and screen sharing. You can try HipChat free. No credit card required. Visit hipchat.com slash twiet. That's hipchat.com slash twiet. Sign up, click on the start chatting button, then invite a few team members and try it free for 30 days. And for the first 100 signups, HipChat is going to extend their 30-day free offer to 90 days. Remember, that's hipchat.com slash twiet. And for the first 100 signups, HipChat again is going to extend their 30-day free trial to 90 days. HipChat, your team, your project in sync instantly. And we thank HipChat for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Let's get back to it. Uh, this is an interesting bit of news out of MWC, the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, Spain. We covered it briefly in a blip, but now I want to go a bit more in depth. Google, according to Sundar Pichai, is going to get into the cell phone service business, or I should say the mobile service business. Now, again, here's what we know. We know that Google will become an NVNO. That's a mobile virtual network operator. That means that they're not actually going to set up their own towers. They're going to leverage the equipment that other telcos, ISPs have. In January, we know that T-Mobile and Sprint both signed agreements to use their infrastructure for Google and in turn for Google to allow their infrastructure to be used by T-Mobile and Sprint. We know that the service will use a combination of licensed spectrum from T-Mobile and Sprint and unlicensed Wi-Fi. And we know that Google wants this to be akin to the Nexus program. In other words, as Sundar said, they don't want to become a carrier of scale. They want to show all the other carriers how it should be done. Now, you could argue that with the Nexus program and with Google Fiber, Google's actually got a really good track record of making this happen. So I want to throw it over to you first, Oliver, and that is, does this have legs? I mean, can Google become a wireless services provider that the other ISPs and the other cell phone companies will look at and say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's that's how we should do it. Well, and toss that right back at you. Do you think Google Fiber has had that effect on the people who, who provide fiber? The, uh, that, well, <laughs> that's actually, that's an interesting uh, uh, call because I'm a techie and I fall, and I want it. I want it a lot. And I believe that the, the threat of Google Fiber has forced incumbents like AT&T and Comcast and Verizon to roll out better products. But there are some who say, no, they were just going to do that anyways. Right? You and I can argue about whether or not you, we're, we've actually seen better products, period, let alone better products because of uh, Google Fiber. I don't think it's a bad thing that, that, that Google's doing it. I just don't think it's going to have the, you know, this, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Open-hearted impact uh, mm. uh, on, on other cell providers that, that you're looking for. I don't think that's how they, how they manage their business. And I don't think they have the same concerns as, as, as Google. Google doesn't mind spending money. Those, those guys do. Right, right. Uh, what about this, Curtis? Is this just, is this a huge business troll from Google? Is this Google saying, no, this is the way you're going to do business. And the other carriers are just going to say, no, sorry, that's not what we do. You know, I'm trying to decide looking at this, whether, um, uh this is the kind of thing that uh, is represented by the, uh, the, the Apple trial balloon that they might be making a car uh, in the next five years, something to, to get some news coverage and some interest uh, where their play is something else. If they're not going to be a real you know, competitor in the market, then the, the big question is, who's their customer? Uh, Aside from a very limited number of techies who were probably going to use it for a, a secondary account, how many people do you know out there who would willingly say, gee, I would love to give my phone service to something that's just an experiment? 
Um, I don't need reliability in an ongoing relationship. Gee, that, that's just not important to me in what is my primary communications medium. I think they've got a tough problem there. So either they're going to look for some partnerships in different formats with the carriers, or this is the first very small salvo in a war that will see them actually trying to become uh, the number five uh, cell carrier with with designs on uh, on passing Sprint and maybe T-Mobile to become one of the top one or two. All right, all right. Chibert, let me throw over to you. This is an interesting situation because we know that Google doesn't really have an interest in providing cell phone service. They're going to do it, but it's just like Google Fiber. They're all about getting customers onto their services. They don't, they don't care how it gets there. And if they have to spend a little bit of money to make that happen, that's what they'll do. And I think that's what they're doing here. But Sundar said something very interesting. If you d dive into his comments, he, and I quote, said, we are creating a backbone so that we can provide connectivity. We'll be working with carriers around the world so that they can provide service over our backbone. Now, this, this ties into a lot of the whispers that us uh, IT junkies have been listening to for the last couple of years. And that is that if if stats were actually made public, most are, are sure that Google would have the largest fiber network in the country, maybe in the world, with all the backbone runs that they've done. They didn't need that all for the services that they run between their data centers. And that's actually where the excess capacity came that drove Google Fiber. Is, is this them now saying, well, we've already built this thing out. We might as well make some partnerships with small telcos and small ISPs and small wireless companies to, to make them do the grunt work for us. Well, you got to keep in, you know, here's a point I need to make. The long view of this is keep in mind the absolute number one cost of lighting up a cell tower. You know, people want more and more wireless. That number one cost is backhaul. Mm. And not only that, it's not only just backhaul. It has to be fast backhaul with low latency. Otherwise, a lot of things in the cell carrier um, infrastructure break. The number one user of precision time switches anywhere are mobile carriers because they need the precision timing. So that's exactly what Google's providing. So if the entry cost for lighting up cells goes way, way down, that means the people that got the really high frequency mobile bands can now start doing affordably do micro cells. So you can increase coverage, increase carrier capacity, uh, but not have to pay these ginormous fees for traditional fiber backhauls. Right. I actually, I want to get back to that uh, that idea of microcells in a bit, but first I want to throw over to Oliver here. Chibert brings up a very important point, and that is the backhaul. We all know that's the, the expensive part. It's not expensive to buy the frequencies. I mean, relatively expensive. It's not expensive to put up the tower, but it is very expensive to get fiber out to those towers so that you can supply them with the bandwidth they need to supply customers. If Google is essentially saying, look, we'll let you use the network we already built out and we will allow you to scale up your operations indefinitely just by allowing us to use your frequencies, this kind of makes it a no-brainer for both T-Mobile and Sprint, right? I mean, they've got nothing to lose. Suddenly they've got access to a bunch of, of, uh, of backhaul that they wouldn't have otherwise. I'll go with that. Uh, I'm a little bit more uh, i expect them to be a little bit more wary uh, uh in line with with curtis's argument that that maybe google is kind of playing possum here uh but yeah as if, if if i'm t-mobile and sprint especially if i'm sprint um anything <laughs> really is, is, is what i'm going for now just anything i mean it, this this uh someone someone wrote this smells like the microsoft nokia duel uh, a, a deal where it sounds like a good deal but this is really just this is Google swallowing up Sprint and T-Mobile at some point in the future. Because if, if T-Mobile and Sprint end up having decent service, but all they really own are the frequencies, then it's it's basically built on Google's network. Uh, uh, what, what about that, Curtis? I mean, is is this is this the grand... Let's get cons conspiratorial here. Is this the grand Trojan horse? Is, is Google entering the, the cell phone service by eating up number three and four? I think that having them eat number four is 
quite realistic. Uh, Sprint uh, is not having the best time out there right now. Uh, number three is a little harder simply because it's part of Deutsche Telekom. Uh, it's not just the U.S. version. Now, now what that would mean, uh, especially in Europe, uh, is iffy to try to figure out just because of the fascinating relationship that Google has already with any number of European regulators. But uh, but Google Sprint is something I could imagine happening uh, before too long, uh, just because it does make sense. Sprint is uh, is number four and falling behind. Um, T-Mobile is a, is a bigger bigger swallow, but uh, Google Sprint. Yeah, I can see that one. All right. I, I want to throw the last one to you, Chibert, because this does get into that mesh. This gets into that uh, the technical side of, of the issue. Uh, I remember, we covered this in episode 112 of, uh, of Twite back in October of 2014. Google, last year, introduced technology that would allow them to deploy hotspots without having to run expensive backhaul. Their, uh, their Google broadband rollout used three different wireless systems. It had... 8 gigahertz, 802.11 AG and AC for local. It had 24.2 gigahertz for mesh wireless. That was Ubiquiti's 25 gigahertz point-to-point -point wireless that could deliver up to 1.4 uh, gigabits per second, up to 13 kilometers away. And then it used a 71 to 76 gigahertz millimeter wave radio for, for long haul, for the back haul, that could deliver up to 10 gigabits per second, up to 25 kilometers away. Back then, it was a curiosity. It, it was one of those interesting projects that Google was working on. But in in the uh, the light of this deal, in the light that that Google wants to use licensed spectrum in addition to unlicensed spectrum, now this makes sense, right? You just install a couple of these, and you can light up every tower in a city. <clears throat> well, not only that, key, um, the the key word here is mesh. What is the number one? pain point for a lot of uh, ISPs. It's someone going in with a backhoe or drill. Someone actually just posted a, a picture in the chat room during Twill of a guy coring to put in a telephone pole and managed to wrap around the drill bit a whole bunch of fiber optics. This happens a lot more frequently, frequently than anyone would like to admit. So when you have a mesh where you can do self-healing, um, wireless networks, um, you've suddenly got the possibility for a ultra-reliable network where you can very quickly heal around problem areas. So if a portion of the city goes down, you know, say there's a power outage, you can still heal around it. Um, that's got some really, really interesting possibilities, you know, for reliability, for safety, um, being able to go and sell special services to... Um, ambulances or police and things like that. So I think this is actually going to open a bunch of new um, markets for Google. And I think one of the other things is it's going to be used to go and attract more and more of these carriers to take over the world. <laughs> Indeed. Well, uh, gentlemen, this next story, uh, for, I, I got to ask first, uh, do, do any of you use an iPhone? I, I don't use an iPhone as my daily driver, but do any of you? Never. I do. You do? Uh, have you used Apple Pay yet? Um, I haven't, largely because the the phone that I use is uh, an iPhone 4. Oh, okay. So I'm just one level above uh, the, you know, I oatmeal box with with uh, kite string. <laughs> now, um, I, I, I will say I've tried it. It's interesting. It's, it's, it's an interesting tech. It actually worked quite well. But there's a story coming out from a security researcher now that... Uh, it has some disconcerting news about Apple Pay. And Oliver, I'm glad that you're on because you were the man who called it right. When we were talking about credit card breaches at Target and some major U.S. retailers, the, the phrase that you said was, when they start feeling the financial pain, that's when they're going to put in the time, the effort, and the resources to get serious about security. Well, we've now got an issue 
with Apple Pay. Uh, of course, it has a lot of buzz. It was rolled out in a big way with some big names signing, signing up to offer Apple Pay options. Apple signed agreements with the banks that provide about 90% of retail transactions. They zoomed up to 1% of the total digital payments uh, in just a few months. And two of every $3 spent on so-called contactless payments with Visa, MasterCard, and American Express were on Apple Pay in the first quarter of 2014, uh, 2015, uh, last month of 2014. However, there's now another Apple Pay buzzword, and that's fraud. A mobile payment consultant by the name of Cherian Abraham described the state of fraud in Apple Pay as rampant. Now, this may come as a surprise because Apple Pay security is actually very robust. If you look at the technology, not only are the devices protected by passwords and fingerprints, but the transaction itself is protected by tokenization which basically means that at no point in the financial transaction is any sensitive information exchanged that can expose private customer information. However, what Abraham found was that there's a problem not in the iPhone or in the tokenization, but in the way that Apple handles provisioning of a credit card that is associated with Apple Pay. When a user adds a credit card to Apple Pay, Apple sends the information along with the last four digits of the phone number to the bank. Most of the time, no significant additional identity confirmation is requested or provided because banks are in such a rush to get part of the Apple pie. And Apple isn't responsible for fraud, so they haven't felt the need to up the level of security as far as the provisioning system is concerned. What this all means, according to Abraham, is that the rate of fraud, which can vary from bank to bank supporting Apple Pay, has, in his research, been as high as 6%. 6% of the total transactions on Apple Pay were frauds. Uh, Oliver, let me throw this out to you. Is, is this, we thought once we started moving to these, these new next generation payments that this sort of fraud would be a thing of the past. We're seeing it again. What's, what's the issue? We did. <laughs> I don't remember <laughs> thinking that that was going to be a thing of the past. <laughs> At all did I remember thinking that was going to be a thing of the past. But okay, if... if if you didn't know, uh, if you go back to what you you tell me, I I called it correctly. With uh, they're they're not going to change anything until they feel the financial pinch. You then uh, it's going to be tough looking at Apple, right? As far as I understand it, they're not responsible financially for any of this fraud, right? It's right. the banks. Mm -hmm. And I was reading a description of how this actually works, and there's a pretty good argument to be made. It's the bank's fault for the types of questions that they're asking and the types of requirements that they have for authenticating. It's not necessarily Apple's fault. But I think both sides need to do better. But uh, if it's if it's going to be the Oliver method, then we're going to have to look at the banks first. All right, right. And I, I get that. And actually, that's, that's what I want to throw over to Curtis, because Curtis, Apple gets 0.15% of every transaction that's made. Uh, so they have an incentive to, to just allow this to happen, especially since they're not responsible for the fraud. The banks, their incentive comes from the fact that they want to become the Apple partner. They want to become the bank that Apple Pay uses the most. So they don't want to put a whole lot in the way of provisioning these cards. They just, they're just going to take the loss uh, after, after fraud is taken out. So you know, going back to, to Oliver's very prophetic words about, about the old credit card system, where does the pain come in? If both sides are basically willing to say, we're going to take the fraud because we just want to grow this thing as fast as possible, it doesn't seem... Like there's a lot of impetus to make the provisioning more difficult. If I tell a bank I can reduce your fraud rate by 5%, but your Apple Pay provisioning is probably going to drop by 50%, there's no bank on the planet that's going to take it. Okay, now here's the interesting thing, and, and it's something that I don't know. And that is whether a payment made through Apple Pay, or, or for that matter, Google Wallet or something like that, is considered a card present transaction or a card not present. Um, the fact that so many people are willing to accept these and, and that uh, Apple can do a, what, one and a quarter percent override makes me think that they're probably treated as a card present transaction. And if that's so, then the actual liability lies not with Apple and not even with the bank, but with the card association, so with Visa or with MasterCard or Discover or, or American Express, 
Uh, and that makes the that makes the impetus to get this right even more difficult because, of course, those associations, especially in the case of MasterCard and Visa, it, it's a broadly shared liability. And and six percent, while it's it's high, isn't outlandish. Um, to me, the interesting thing is that no one is saying that this is a failure of technology. Mm -hmm. uh, the Apple Pay system hasn't been cracked. Uh, it, it is a human factors uh, failure. Like, like Oliver said, they're not asking the right questions. They're not making sure that the individuals using the technology are trustworthy. And that's a whole, whole different level of problem um, because it can be so quick and so many assumptions are made about people who are using it. Um, my strong suspicion is that the, the level of fraud that we're seeing isn't dramatically higher, uh, if it's higher at all, than the standard levels of fraud. What we aren't seeing, though, is a reduced level. And that's what everybody is hoping for, because reducing the fraud level by even 1% would more than allow people to jack up the intermediate skims, uh, like Apple's one and a quarter percent, uh, while leaving everybody else happy as can be. Right. Right. And actually, uh, to that point, what they found is that regular plastic, the old non-chip and pin credit cards, had a fraud rate of about 0.1%, which sounds a lot lower than 6%, but you have to remember the volumes of transactions on those two technologies are they're non comparable it's ridiculous i mean it's you know digital payments have not yet caught up in fact if you talk about digital payments the leader in digital payments is not apple pay with 1% or even google wallet with uh, with their new acquisition is 4% but it's paypal with 78% and all of that combined still doesn't add up to what you get with the old credit card. So we, we got to talk about scale here for a bit. But Chibert, I want to throw this over to you. I think Curtis is absolutely right. This is not a failure of the technology. No one broke the encryption. No one broke the, the tokenization. This is simply maybe a transitional part where people haven't really figured out how to verify a contactless payment system. Because the way that the fraud works is this. You have people who are stealing credit cards. They'll, they'll, provision that onto an Apple device, onto an iPhone, they'll go and they'll basically buy a bunch of gift cards. And because it's on the phone, no one's checking ID. Well, at some point, we're just going to move to check ID whenever someone makes a contact list, yes? You know, who knows? Um, the, the industry swings back and forth, and the pendulum is we want to create market. <clears throat> Sooner or later, one can only hope, Someone's going to look up and say, wow, this is actually costing us a lot of money. Uh, let's go do something about it. So we'll, we'll see. I don't know. You know, the, um, the automated verification systems that are on the back end on websites and so forth have gotten significantly more secure over the years. Um, maybe what we might see someday is um, maybe there's going to be like a hash of the value for the fingerprint that goes along with it. Um, the internet payment, they actually go and start, you know, recording the IP address you came from so that the, um, the refutiation levels can go down. When the University of Hawaii went to online registration, one of the things that we did when we designed is we started recording um, the person's voice for touch tone, you know, so over the phone. And we also started recording the IP address you came from and our refutiation level dropped by almost five, uh, almost 10%, which is, you know, on a school-wide registration, that's many millions of dollars. Uh, so I can see the same thing happening. Eventually, um, someone's going to figure it out and say, hey, uh, let's go and, uh, hold on to the cash of the fingerprint that's being used in Apple Pay Um and that way, it's also evidence for the fraud cases. Oliver, I'm going to give you the last word because you're batting 1,000 as far as financial uh, 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 future fortune telling is concerned. I think you're right. I think your old maxim holds, which is they're not going to change anything unless they feel financial pain. So where's the financial pain going to come here? I mean, if Apple's still making their money and if the banks are still making their money, if as long as they, they make enough money elsewhere, and if the retail points that are accepting Apple Pay are making their money, there's no financial pain. And you just answered your own question. 
So it's never going to change. Man, can't you ever give me a happy story, Oliver? I'm sorry, man. It's, 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 it's not, somebody's going to have to sue somebody and win. Oh. And I don't know who that's, that's going to be, but I'm going to bet it's not Apple. Folks, Oliver Wrist would also like you to know that there is no Santa Claus, uh, no, no Easter Santa Bunny, <laughs> and that someone's probably not looking out for you. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for hanging around for another hour of the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to nine out of ten Apple Pay pay points. Uh, I, I want to thank my panel for being here. Of course, let's start with Oliver. Oliver, it's always a pleasure to have you on. Could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you because you just moved back over the East Coast and you're you're getting up, you're getting you're getting your work out there. Where can they see what you've been writing? Uh, they can't. I'm I'm not writing much. I'm moving up on 50 and trying to make a baby. So right now I am uh, dehydrated and tired. So be a while before I crawl out of my cave. Okay, and I, I'm pretty sure we don't want to have people check up on you making a baby. So exactly. all of a risk. Yeah. Stay away. We'll have you back on. Uh, also, thanks to my co-host. Let's start with you, Chibert. What's going on in your part of the world, uh, aside from you playing with some very interesting sensor technologies? Well, actually, my biggest problem right now is just a lack of time. I, you know, my, my life goes in feast or famine cycles because I'm completely soft money. If I don't bring in grants and contracts, I don't eat. Uh, right now, I am swamped beyond reason. I, can't, I can barely see. I'm... Uh, not getting a ton of sleep because I'm trying to just keep up with everything. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, we're just a month or two shy of my wife being unemployed for nearly two years. And I should remind the world that turning someone down for a job interview because they're overqualified is an equal employment opportunity violation. My wife has put in several hundred job applications for job offers and has only gotten maybe half a dozen interviews. And I'll bet you most of those are because they think she's overqualified and she's not willing to take a pay cut uh, for less responsibility. So rant, rant, rant. Hawaii, wah, wah. get it together. Come on, Hawaii. Now, hopefully some happier news from the other side of the country. Uh, Curtis, what have you been up to on Information Week Radio? I know you've got Interop coming up, so there's probably some prep going on, yeah? Lots of prep going on for Interop. Uh, we had uh, another uh, Interop Engineering, Interop Net Engineering meeting today, as we do every week. Uh, the pieces are coming together. Uh, I've got a lot of travel coming up. Uh, in two weeks, I'll be at the Enterprise Connect show in Orlando. Uh, show that we produce, and I believe I'll get a chance uh, to see my favorite Jesuit there. Um, and then we, I come home for a couple of days and head to Hot Stage for two weeks. Back home for two weeks, then uh, to Interop for a couple of weeks. It's going to be an exciting couple of months, and uh, got plenty going on. Interop Radio, Tuesdays at 3 p.m., uh, Information Week Live. Fridays at 3 p.m., uh, follow me at KG4GWA to get URLs, guests, and all kinds of exciting stuff about all radio. Well, gentlemen, thank you so very much for being on. We wouldn't have Twyatt without you. You know who else we wouldn't have Twyatt without? Without you. That's right, the person who downloads us, who watches us, who listens to us each and every single week. So we always like to make sure that we do something nice for you. And what we're going to do Let's make it easy for you to get every episode of This Week at Enterprise Tech on your device of choice automatically. All you need to do, to, to do is go to our show page at twit.tv slash twiet. There you will find all of our back episodes along with the show notes. So you get links if you have a story that you want to check out. And you'll find a little drop down menu so you can get the audio version or the video version or the high definition video version into your, your iPhone, your iPad, your Android tablet or device, your Mac, your PC, your laptop, your desktop. No matter what format you want, we're going to get it for you because, well, we love you. Also, don't forget that we do this show live every Friday. That's right. We've got a brand new time at 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific time. Just go to live.twit.tv and you can see the pre-show, the post-show, and everything in between, including the bloopers that we take out of the final revision. If you want to see how the sausage is made, join us at live.twit.tv. And as long as you're watching us live, why not jump into the chat room? You'll see me looking up here every once in a while. That's because that's where chat room lives, right, right in that space. I listen to you during the show. I take your questions and I make sure that 
our conversation is going where you want it to go. So just go to irc.twit.tv and you can be part of the experiment that is Twit Live. Also, don't forget that you can find me on Twitter. If you want to know what's going to be on every episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech, just go to twitter.com slash Padre SJ. There you'll find topics not only for This Week in Enterprise Tech, but for the other shows I do on Twit TV, including Know How and Coding 101, Padre's Corner, and Before You Buy. Just go to twitter.com slash Padre SJ, follow me, and uh, see what's going to be going on even when I'm not on the air. Finally, I want to thank everyone here in the studio who makes this show possible. Of course, to Lisa and to Leo for letting me be on the stream. To Carson, my super producer, and to my brand new TD. We're just breaking him in. He's a good guy, so folks, please bear with him. He's going to make a couple of mistakes before he gets icy solid on this. It's Zach. That's right, Eskimo Zach. Could you, could you say hi to the folks at home, Eskimo Zach? Hello, everybody at home, and sorry for the mistakes I make. Oh, and folks, by the way, Eskimo Zach just passed 100 Twitter followers. So uh, if any of you want to see a man who is just really happy to get every follower, follow him at where? At Eskimo Zach. That's Z-A-C-H. Fantastic. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Fallis here reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep twilight.